The M1 Abrams is regarded by many as the best main battle tank in the world. While several countries certainly have some excellent contenders for first place, the Abrams has a secret weapon that gives it the edge over its competition. Hidden deep inside the belly of the tank is what gives it the ability to shoot and move like it does, the Honeywell AGT-1500 gas turbine engine. Let's take a closer look at why this engine is so OP. For starters, the engine is an absolute beast. Utilizing a gas turbine engine with both high and low pressure compressors combined with a high and low pressure power turbine, it produces a mind-boggling 1500 horsepower of energy. When put into the tank, it can propel the Abrams an impressive 45 miles per hour on roads and about 30 miles per hour off-road. With the Abrams being only one of two tanks in service with a gas turbine engine, the other being an early version of Russia's T-80, the story of how it came to be might be surprising. If you were thinking why the Abrams has a literal jet engine, you wouldn't be the only one raising an eyebrow. During its development, it was also a controversial subject. In the early 1960s, the US decided they want to increase the lethality of their main battle tank. While the M60 had served well, many people considered it a very underpowered tank. Weighing in at over 50 tons combat loaded, it was one of the heaviest tanks the US had fielded to this point, and it was the heaviest main battle tank in service. But there was just one problem. Powering the M60 was a Continental diesel engine that produced just a measly 750 horsepower, and this severely limited both on-road and off-road speed and maneuverability. With the Soviets developing faster tanks, American Army officers did not want their tanks to be outrun and outflanked by Soviet tank formations simply because they could not move well. They also knew that American tanks would continue getting heavier with increased armor to defeat developing Soviet guns and ammunition. Because of this fear, the military began a joint effort with the West Germans in their MBT-70 project. The MBT-70 was supposed to use the expertise in German engineering to build a better tank engine for the project. After all, Defense Secretary Robert McNamara was apparently a huge fan of German engineering and believed that the two nations could build an unstoppable tank with their engines and American guns and armor. However, not all went according to plan. German tank development had not kept pace with the Cold War developments. Differences in opinion and soaring costs started making Congress officials doubt the project. With ballooning costs several times above initial estimates, Congress pulled the plug. While the DoD was directed to develop a new tank, they would have to do so cost-effectively. With their marching orders in hand, Army officials began their new project, the XM-803, which later morphed into the XM-1 project. Over the next decade, the Army experimented with numerous radical design changes meant to increase the lethality of American tanks, not just now, but for generations to come. One of those revolutionary changes was picking a gas turbine engine over traditional diesel or gasoline engines, a decision spurred by the engine's effectiveness in helicopters during the 1960s. Lycoming was the first company to produce aircraft engines for the Army. Its state-of-the-art design was lighter and more powerful than traditional engines. This was a big deal, as it allowed helicopters to carry more fuel, ammo, or people. The gas turbine engine family they developed was also less maintenance-intensive than previous helicopter engines. Though the initial cost was higher up front, over time the cost per flight hour went down as aircraft spent less time on the ground getting serviced. With this idea in mind, Army officers decided to do the same thing for their tanks. After all, the cost proposals from the two main competitors were not too far off from one another. However, the increased cost savings from less maintenance enticed the Army leadership to take the plunge, since maintenance costs make up the bulk of a tank's price tag for most of its life. After awarding the contract to Chrysler, which eventually became General Dynamics Land Division after Chrysler sold its stake in its military production plant, the engine started being tested. Results among the troops who first used the vehicles were more than stellar. While things like gunnery and armor were of course high on the list, its ability to move quickly surprised all the stakeholders. But there was just one problem. The tank, as predicted, was a gas guzzler. Even though this didn't shock anyone, the main problem was its initial models were not equipped with an auxiliary power unit that forced the tankers to run the engine on idle and burn through fuel. In the tank world, an auxiliary power unit is like a mini-engine. Its purpose is to provide power to the tank's main systems like its fire control, night vision, and fire suppression systems. Before the introduction of APUs, tank crews of old had to run their vehicle's engines all the time, wasting fuel and making the tank easier to spot. By incorporating an APU, tank crews can now fight in fixed positions or stay on an overwatch duty while not wasting gas. Of course, if the tank had to move, the crew could immediately start the engine and go. But for long hours of sitting still, an APU is required to ensure fuel consumption is kept to a minimum. After initial test trials in Europe, Army officials had Chrysler install an APU. 
However, this was not the only issue that arose with those early tests that called into question using gas turbines. For example, because the engine required huge amounts of air to be sucked through its intakes, the original air filters weren't advanced enough to block fine dust and debris like sand. As a result, the initial XM1 tanks did not function well in dry and sandy environments. While the solution was rather simple, making better air filters, these problems caused enough of a stink with Congress officials to order a diesel engine be produced. Congress argued that because the Army kept finding issues with the gas turbine engine, they needed to develop a diesel engine design at the same time as the current design. That way, if all else was equal, then the tank was ready to enter combat minus an engine. The military could just drop a trusty diesel engine in and figure out how to implement a gas turbine later. Fortunately for General Dynamics, they worked through all the early issues and continued to improve on their earlier design. Even though the APU cut down wasteful fuel consumption significantly, it still did not help the fact that the tank was and still is very fuel inefficient. Getting just under a mile a gallon, the Abrams is arguably one of the least fuel efficient tanks on the battlefield today. General Dynamics was acutely aware of this problem and began working with Honeywell to incorporate changes into the AGT-1500 design starting in the 1980s. During the first round of trials meant to improve fuel economy, the two companies incorporated a number of changes. The high-pressure turbine rotor was made more efficient and durable. A new special coating was applied to the high-pressure turbine cylinder to prevent air leakage. The design team changed the materials used to make the recuperator, and the power turbines themselves were resized to ensure maximum fuel efficiency. Even so, these changes only made the tank about 10% more fuel efficient, but that was enough. However, this was not the only development that made the Army like the engine more. One of the main reasons that the Army chose the gas turbine engine over a diesel one was the fact that it was digital. With computers becoming the way of the future, Army officials knew that the best main battle tanks of the future would be operated using computers. Because of this, the brains of the engine are in its electronic control unit. The purpose of this computer is to provide real-time fuel control to the engine to maximize fuel efficiency. But of course, as this is the case with any type of engine, it's not immune to breaking down. Fortunately for tank crews, Honeywell thought of a solution to that too. Known as the Turbine Engine Diagnostics, or TED, the military helped develop this system during the early 1990s. This was designed to help soldiers in the field quickly find any problems with the engines, repair said problem, and then get back to the fight as fast as possible. Because computers could have many unseen faults associated with them, traditional methods of troubleshooting common issues like an engine failing to start are more difficult and TED fixed those problems. During a feasibility study funded by the Army, soldiers from several National Guard units were tested on their ability to diagnose what caused an Abrams engine not to start. While the examiners knew what they did to cause the fault, the soldiers didn't. During the first trial, soldiers were asked to troubleshoot only using tech manuals and what they previously learned in training. During the second trial, new faults were introduced and the soldiers were told to troubleshoot using the software. The results were better than anything the Army could have hoped for. A breakdown of the test results showed that among junior mechanics, TED software helped them accurately diagnose problems two to four times as often compared to traditional methods. Even among older, more senior personnel, the software improved their abilities to diagnose the problem by another 10%. What this meant for commanders in the field was that they were eliminating a lot of the guesswork that came with troubleshooting. Instead of waiting around for a part they never actually needed, mechanics could diagnose and fix problems much faster, meaning they could get the tank back in the fight sooner. But providing amazing software to help troubleshoot unknown faults was not the only thing that made the engine a dream to work with on the battlefield. Its modular design makes maintenance a breeze. Before the Abrams, most tanks that required major engine overhauls or even needed their entire engine replaced needed to be withdrawn from service. Instead of being in the fight, tanks would be relegated to sitting at a maintenance depot, while crews worked day and night to take the tank apart so they could get to the engine. The AGT-1500 turned that practice on its head. This engine featured a completely modular design, meaning that a small crew of soldiers could take out an entire engine with a crane in the field. On average, a whole engine can get swapped out in the field in about four hours. So in a worst-case scenario, where a commander has no desire or time to troubleshoot an engine or repair damage, the whole thing can get swapped out for a new one while the old one gets sent back for repair. But quick changeouts aren't the only thing the Army's interested in. Since the early 2000s, in an initiative known as the Total Integrated Engine Revitalization, or TIGER, the Army has worked hand-in-hand -hand with the defense industry to overhaul all the existing AGT-1500 engines and improve them. These improvements included replacing older parts with newer ones that are stronger, more ergonomic, and fuel-efficient. This ongoing program means that even if the Abrams hulls are decades old, the engines powering them are as new as if they just came off the factory floor. Now you need to watch Key Weapon for Ukraine's next stage of war, or have a look at why US enemies are scared of Abrams X.